I'm getting the last in there. I'm gonna have some fun. I know that I'm pretty much all at standing between you and beer. So I should be quick. Make sure we get you to the fronts of the line. Uh, this is a, I have not, I did that last year when I was here. Who was here last year? Oh, lots of hands. Did anybody catch that history.net talk I did? Oh, fantastic, okay. This is not that talk. <laughs> Uh, but there seems to be an interest in me acting as historian lately. And so uh, I was asked if I could do a history of web development. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I've been through a lot of that too. Plus I'm a good researcher, that's my, my pleasure. And so it was an opportunity to gather some notes and to remind myself of some old things. And uh, I, this will be a little nostalgic. And for those who don't know, uh, I was born down here. I was born in, in, in Taranga in New Zealand. I have a Kiwi passport, I have a Canadian one as well. I live in Canada now. And uh, this is my place. The my place is actually on the left. My neighbor's house on the right. This is British Columbia. And uh, this is about six in the morning on a Wednesday. Wednesday is garbage day. So we have visitors that, uh, that check to see if we put out our garbage early. Now, this particular fellow is a male. He's about 250 kilos. And uh, he's a good bear. Because if you do put your garbage out early, he will simply open the can, take the bag out, and then go back into that ravine. So basically, the bear takes your garbage out for you. Uh, and you notice he's still standing right at the edge there. He's sort of looking over the, the cul-de-sac to decide where he's going to go next, because he's disappointed I didn't put my garbage out early. But he's a regular visitor. Uh, th this is taken from a nest cam. We call this camera the animal highway. Last week, there was uh, a mom and two cubs. They came to basically that same point and then watched and decided there's too many people and turned around and went back the other way. And I've also got shots of coyotes and raccoons and skunks and deer and uh, bobcats and uh, the occasional domesticated cat going, what the heck am I doing outside? Because it's pretty dangerous out there. So that's living in British Columbia. Uh, I wrote my first line of code in 1977, which is not the most important thing to happen in 1977. The most important thing is Star Wars. Uh, wrote that line of code, it was 10 print Hello World on a TRS-80 Model 1. 4K RAM, cassette tape player, 127 by 47 resolution, and a version of BASIC not written by Microsoft. It was a tiny BASIC, and it only had three error messages. What? <laughs> How? <laughs> and sorry. Which is the best error message of all time. Very Canadian error message too, I might add. What's object not found, but sorry. Uh, so I've had a long career. It's over 40 years now. I've done a lot of different things in technology one way or the other. You may know me for making a certain number of podcasts. Uh, any .NET Rocks listeners? Wow, awesome. So we're recording .NET Rocks down here. Uh, first time since, I think it was TechEd 2009 was the last time we made shows in Australia. So Carl started .NET Rocks back in 2002. These are free to download podcasts. We put out two a week. Uh, yesterday we published episode 1582, so there's a few of them. Don't listen to them all. It's a long, a, it's a long time, and some of it's not real relevant, you know. But if you want the entire history of Silverlight, top to bottom, we have it in shows. So, from the happy announcement to the what the heck happened, like we've got all of that. Uh, I also make an IT Pro related podcast called Runners Radio. We just published its 600th episode. Started in, uh, it's every Wednesday since April 11th of 2007, and for a brief interval when we weren't sure if .NET rocked anymore, we made a show called The Tablet Show. That was right after Build in 2011, when we were all kind of freaked out. And then we were talking about iOS and Android and cross-platform stuff. We made 130 of those, and then we rolled it into .NET rocks when it became apparent that .NET still rocked. But we're not gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about the internet. This is a ping map from 2012 of all the IP reachable addresses. It's nice to see at least a part of Australia lit up there. Kind of the edge of the internet, really. Some of these islands in the middle of nowhere are pretty interesting that they have, uh, they have IP addresses. They got cables running to them one way or the other. And we know that the internet existed well before the web did, although most people just can't think of the internet without thinking of the web. And certainly the mortals, when they can't find their Internet Explorer icon, say, I broke the internet. Right? The web is simply a service that travels over the internet. It was started by this young man. Tim Berners-Lee, now Sir Tim Berners-Lee, with his Order of the British Empire, who in 1989, being a researcher working at CERN, so he was a programmer working for physicists at CERN, 
And one of their big challenges was managing all of these research papers that they were connecting to each other and trying to understand them. So he really had that core idea of, I want to be able to share scientific papers linked together through their footnotes, that, that, that core idea of the hyperlinking. Um, this is actually a later, somewhat later picture, but not too much later, because he has hair. Uh, he wrote that original version. So you gotta think about what this guy took on, that I wanna be able to, to have a service that will allow you to connect these documents together and then have a client that can read them and do that interrelation. So he had to write everything. He did it on a next, which means clearly he was not paying for the computer himself. This, is, this was Steve Jobs' project in between being booted out of Apple and coming back to Apple. It, was, it has a magnesium case, because that's a good idea. Uh, and it was mostly sold to academics with outrageous budgets, and that's where we largely saw these machines. The operating system would eventually become what we'd known as Mac OS. This is actually a picture of Tim Berners-Lee's actual machine that he ran the first web server and the first web browser on, and that there's a sticker on there. It's a little partially ripped off. You can go see this machine, by the way. It's still at CERN. It's behind glass now. But that sticker actually says, this machine is a server. Do not power down because there was staff at CERN that would go around turning off all the desktop machines that people had forgotten to shut off, and that's really bad for the web when that's the only web server in the whole world. <laughs> this is the very first web page. Notice a distinct lack of porn. <laughs> In fact, they, this initial format is modified SGML that we'd eventually know as HTML, didn't have image tags yet. Don't worry, they're coming. There's not a lot to talk about this very early stage of the web. It was very much an academic tool, obviously, you know, started at CERN, it spread. Now, the earlier stages of the internet when we're still in the private, we were still in that private time, this is a DARPA initiative. They're moving a lot of nuclear weapons information around it. It's tied between universities and military sites. And so they adopted web fairly quickly. So for me, having played around with computers since the 70s, my first experiences touching the internet was by stealing bandwidth from, internet, from universities. They were remarkably insecure. We'd go dumpster diving just looking for reams of paper and they'd literally be printed out usernames and passwords on them. And that would get us logged into through X14 uh, protocols and eventually get us onto the internet such as it was. And, uh, but a long time later before we'd actually have a browser to play with, it was mostly text-based. One of the very first browsers you'll ever see came out of a university, actually the, uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Computing at Urbana-Champaign, and this was uh, Mosaic. Now there were some text-based uh, browsers early on, but this was one of the first graphical ones. One of the principal developers behind this was a young man by the name of Mark Andreessen. And Mark would quickly figure out that this was a huge opportunity, and he would start a company called Netscape and they would try to commercialize these early versions of the browser. And he did want to try and sell the browser. It didn't go well for him. But you know, this is the beginning of what we'd eventually call the .NET com boom, although it, this is before that. In 1994, it's still, the internet is very much a, 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 a university thing and a government thing. 1995 is when all that changes. So now, the US government, takes a certain number, the, the National Science Foundation net stuff off of the public internet. They stop putting government funds into it. They make a deal with what will ultimately become uh, the uh, management committees, still US controlled but independent, and they make commercialization legal. So 95 is sort of the turning point of a commercial internet. And this is when the various connectivity services that existed ahead of the public internet, like AOL and CompuServe, provide gateways into the internet. So my AOL account is 103.055.1500, and I pray someday I will get those neurons back, that I still remember that useless, useless number. But you know, we had our own networks to surf and to connect to via our dial-up modems.
and then bit by bit this internet got made available to us. Microsoft jumped on board with Internet Explorer. This is actually IE3 on Win95. It's 1995. Uh, Bill realized that the internet was going to be a thing. He didn't buy into it at first. He, was, he thought that the cable companies were going to be the way it was going. It was going to be interactive TV. That's what Microsoft was focused on, was interactive TV. But when the commercialization of the internet became possible, became, or became legal, in May of 95, he released a paper internal to the company called the Internet Tidal Wave. And what it basically said was everybody needs to stop what you're doing and make sure that your product works with the internet in some way. This is when cool, wonderful things happened, like you could output a SQL query to HTML. I didn't, you know, because Bill said you had to incorporate some internet technology, and the SQL team's like, I know what we could do. I mean, it wasn't a good idea. It just shows the power of Bill, that when Bill says, we all go that way, everybody went that way. Uh, by 95, we did have HTML2, and HTML2 had clearly the most important feature in HTML, which is tables. And you could do everything you needed in tables. So it's been fun to find, to find a graphic of tables. This is one apparently from 97. So that's what we get out of HTML2, although it's really HTML2.1 if you want to get technical about this. And I bump into people who do get technical about this sort of thing. But it's like very early HTML. We do have now images, and we have tables. That's fine on the front end. What are we doing on the back end? How are you programming the back end, the web servers? of the day, largely with languages like Perl. Um, Perl looks like cartoon swearing. <laughs> What's beautiful about Perl, like a chunk of code like this, is that uh, there's way more spaces in it than we need to. We could make this all one line if we actually wanted to. They, and this just begins a long history of the web depending on write once, read never languages. And don't worry, we're not done yet. There are going to be many, many more. But Perl is one of the first scripting languages for doing back-end programming right in 95. But it's not the only one. There were a bunch of things that get launched all at the same time in 95. They weren't particularly popular or relevant. But they all start right then. Cold Fusion by a group called Allaire actually starts in 95. It'll take a few years to catch on, and it's good enough that it, and you're going to see this theme that happens in these early internet technologies. And again, remember, dot com boom, right? This is what's coming. It's 95, 96, 97. The dot com boom's coming, and we all know when it ends. And so Cold Fusion starts out on its own, but by 2001, it'll be acquired by Macromedia, just in time for the dot com bust, and then acquired by Adobe because that's where good software goes to die. Uh, <laughs> The original versions of, of Cold Fusion were actually written in C++, although they eventually implemented both a Java version and a .NET version. Uh, and it went open source in 2008. PHP starts in 1995. Erasmus Lordorf uh, was a young man who wanted to maintain his homepage, and he was tired of writing Perl. And so he created a set of tools, largely written in C, that he could call into for his personal home page, which is why it's called PHP. He was just trying to make a personal home page, and it got way out of control. <laughs> Within a couple of years, he simply admits, look, I just wanted to maintain a home page. I don't know anything about making languages, in which the rest of the community said, we can tell. <laughs> but better language people will come along and turn PHP into another well-known, extremely popular write once, read never language. Also in that time frame, we start seeing the beginnings of programming environments that we'll depend on for a long time. First versions of Java come in 95, and they quickly jump on the internet bandwagon with a concept called applets and servlets. Again, not good ideas, but they were trying. Uh, Microsoft will try it with uh, their COM technology, which at this point they'll have rebranded ActiveX. And in fact, they'll brand everything they can find with an ActiveX for a while there, including creating an ActiveX component you can put in an Internet Explorer if you really want to build a page that nobody can stand. Other important technologies in that time span. Uh, Macromedia will start working on Shockwave. They'll also have another company they acquire called Future Splash, and they'll kind of pull all that stuff together and call it Flash, which of course will then get bought by Adobe and killed by Steve Jobs. 
Uh, JavaScript will be named because it has nothing to do with Java whatsoever. So Brenda and Ike actually worked for Netscape, and they realized they needed a glue language. They needed some way to sort of pull these pieces together. And the apocryphal story is that the prototype of JavaScript was assembled in 10 days, which explains a lot. It was originally called Mocha. Then they tried to call it LiveScript. Then some marketing geniuses decided to attach it onto the Java bandwagon because that's not going to be confusing for anybody. We get our first serious web servers. So uh, Microsoft jumped on board with that internet tidal wave with NT351. That's the first version of Internet Information Server, uh, literally right at the beginning in 95. Apache, the thing that's cool about Apache is that it's kind of an emerged product. So in those early Unix days, in the NCSA, the same place where they did Mosaic, there were a bunch of scripts you could run against a, a, a Unix machine to create something that would act as if it was a web server. Literally, it was a set of patches. And so somebody said, are you going to run that patchy server? And yes, yes, this is a very patchy server. And so they, they've tied it to the First Nations group, but I'm telling you, its name is actually, it's a patchy server. And will, of course, spawn the foundation. And I put these two right side by side as equivalents to each other for everything that's right and everything that's wrong about it. Both these tools ended up being these Swiss army knives of everything you could imagine you might need on the web, except that all the knives are out. <laughs> and so you can't help but poke yourself when you try and pick it up. But it was the beginning of the public internet and the beginning of the web. And so we were all just trying to make stuff work. And so having services on, you know, this is a technology that came out of an academic world that just had no consideration for security of any kind. And we are still wrestling with the consequences of that. Other great technology was developed in the same time period. Woo. So Vermeer in Massachusetts, actually, in 95, built the first, their, their first prototype of this WYSIWYG uh, web page editor, because nobody knew what good HTML looked like anyway. Microsoft buys it by 97 and rides that horse for about 10 years, because front page extensions is a good idea. Uh, and maybe a little bit more loved technology around that same time, uh, Dreamweaver, which will be acquired by Macromedia, and then, of course, Macromedia acquired by Adobe. I still meet people who, who have fond memories of Dreamweaver, but I feel like they're like their cartoon that you loved as a child. Keep that memory because it's a lie. If you look at it now, you're, it's like Kentucky Fried Chicken. We all loved Kentucky Fried Chicken as a kid. Have you had it today? Keep your memory, and your memory's better. By 97, we get our first version of Visual Studio. Microsoft has this idea that we should consolidate all these different development tools that they're building. The Visual Studio IDE is actually written by the Visual InterDev team, which explains a lot. The goal, of course, was to make a unified IDE environment for all these different tools that Microsoft made. They will never achieve that goal. When they shipped Visual Studio 97, yes, it had a unified IDE that both InterDev and J++ used. Visual Basic had its own IDE that just ran from inside the box. So did FoxPro. So did C++. And they'll make another version that'll do the same thing again. It's only when they go to .NET that they actually consolidate the IDEs. But we do get active server pages. So they found a way to deliver us calm in a form that was a little less painful than ActiveX controls on a browser. So by IIS, we get the first version of active server pages in 96 in IIS 3. And then the uh, second version, 97 IS4, the final version in 2000 IS5, and then ASP.NET will take over. When we finally get to W3C, and the W3C gets together and says, we need to make some standards around HTML. So we're going to start with the first version, 3.2, <laughs> showing that it's not just Microsoft that cannot number things. So initially, uh, Netscape pretty much built, Netscape, uh, built HTML2. Right? That's where you see that version of HTML. They then 
for, got involved with creating a committee process to try and have a standard set of HTML requirements. And this is really, we're inventing the way that we set these standards. And all we knew for sure is we looked at the SQL standards body and said, don't do that. So they set out a set of requirements. They set a deadline for all the things you need to deliver for the next version of HTML. So the next version of HTML was going to be three, except that the deadline was set in such a way that nobody delivered anything on time. And rather than fix their rules, they just declared version three dead and tried again. And 3.1 failed also. 3.2 is the first time that enough people actually submitted their, the, the specifications they wanted to, to have assessed, that they had a quorum so they could now argue about it. So it took three tries to get to the argument. That's how well the committee worked. Now, the real question is, does it make sense for a group of architects to sit together talking through the structure of a language, or should you just build it and see what happens? And that battle went on and continues to go on in how we create languages. Netscape got tired of waiting and just started making HTML3 things. And when the committee changed the number, they would just change their number and keep going. Uh, one of the great examples of this is Ajax. Because Ajax is still not a ratif ratified specification according to the W3C. Right? The, original, the initial prototype of Ajax, what we would eventually call Ajax, which are originally the XML HTTP request, is implemented by Internet Explorer first. Why? Because the Exchange guys wanted to build a web client for Exchange. And so they took advantage of the fact that these guys are like in buildings next to each other. They went by and said, hey, we really want to be able to pop up a little thing, you've got mail in our web client. Could you add to IE an ability to just sort of make a request and we could tell it have mail and you could draw something on the screen? And they're like, okay. And they just added it to IE. Now we've gone a lot further on that concept since then, but because it never went through committee in the first place, I think everybody's still resentful of the fact that they've, it's never been ratified. It's 2018. It's 20 years ago we had Ajax of a sort. It's still not been ratified. So we actually ratified the specification of 3.2 in January of 97. And then we immediately hate it and start working on the next version. By December of 97, same year, we have HTML4, which we hate so much that by April of 98, we have 4.01. Because spelling mistakes in the specification. OK. Now. I don't like this. Once upon a time, you put these on your web page. Right? These, uh, I grab, that's where you get these symbols from. It's like, yeah, we're HTML4. Uh, when the HTML5 came along, they built a much nicer graphic. So, uh, you know, I like this one better. Although this one's kind of, you know, because it's got that implied table in there. <laughs> My favorite version is actually by a guy named Maurice Melkers. It's like, well, if you want to actually correct the logo, it should look like this. <laughs> that is the proper HTML4 logo. But that's not the important thing that happened. By, you think about this. We had a specification that people essentially agreed on in April of 98, 20 years ago, for HTML4. And it included CSS. So you knew it was going to be awesome. This is the best mug in the world. Everybody needs to own this mug. Also in 98, we get the next version of Visual Studio, which everything is numbered six, including the second and last version of InterDev, the third and last version of J++, because numbers are hard. But a more important thing that happens in Visual Studio here, actually, is that this guy joins Microsoft. Mr. Guthrie's first and only job out of university is to work for Microsoft, and he works on Studio 6. It actually works on the NT option pack. He'd had his choice of jobs at Microsoft, believe it or not. I've, been, I've had a good, uh, the opportunity to talk to him extensively for the book that someday I'll actually finish writing. And uh, he was convinced to work on the NT option pack. But they suggested at the time, it's like, we know we need to change this fundamentally. We know that the way we're currently doing web development is wrong. So while you're working on this, I want you to start thinking about it differently. Now, he came in in early uh, 98, 
and worked on it, so they were already well underway. They shipped Studio 98 in November of 98. And the apocryphal but true story is, the end, when they ship at the end, of, uh, at the end of November, they normally take a couple of weeks off after you ship a product like that. It's hard work, right? And that basically ran into Christmas. So most of the team took all of Christmas, all of December off, but not our young Mr. Guthrie. Being a young man who did not want to go back to North Carolina for Christmas, he worked through the whole thing. He now had his idea. Mostly he knew how much he hated active server pages. And I, I also had the good fortune to have actually looked at, his, when I sat down to do interviews with him about the history of .NET, he brought his paper notebooks from 1997 with him. He has them. He offered them to me. I'm like, needs to be in a museum. Don't give to me. <laughs> Should be under nitrogen. The pages are starting to turn yellow. But I literally have, I have seen the original drawing of request and response. And that's what he was thinking about, was how do we build uh, a way to program web pages where the programming language that we use is object-oriented, top to bottom, and allows us to interact with the web page in a, in a much safer way, type-safe way, a construct-safe way. Blue screening is not a strategy. He gets a prototype together, more or less, in that period in December. He took a break and went skiing on like Christmas Day. That's about all he did. And in January, he shows off the prototype, he calls it ASP+. And the programming language that you would use is, any guesses? Java. It's Java. It's J++, because that's the only object-oriented language Microsoft had at the time. Visual Basic does not count. And they said, that's cool. You can't use Java. The lawsuit's already been filed. <laughs> and, uh, and without that lawsuit, C Sharp never would have happened. But you know, they, that's the path they were on. You know, what's interesting about C Sharp is that's the first and only language Microsoft's ever invented from scratch. They always implemented other existing languages. It was only because the situation was Sun that they were basically put to such, needed to make a language. Now, that's not the only thing that's going at the time in Microsoft space. By Oct August of 98, Mr. Gates is asked to go before a Senate committee. You can watch this Senate discussion on YouTube if you care to. It's a, I'm pretty sure that before Mark Zuckerberg went before the US Senate, he watched all of this with a group of people pointing at it saying, don't do this. This is a mistake. Uh, because the Senate came down pretty hard on him. And I have a, I have a picture of a Time Magazine cover that I used uh, from 95, where they call Bill the master of the universe. He's like balancing a, a five and a quarter inch floppy on the end of his finger. But in 99, that's the cover of Time Magazine. Because he, Microsoft gets declared a pernicious monopoly in order to break up into two companies, an operating system company and an everything else company. Now, that doesn't happen. You know, Bomber will take over. He will successfully, over almost two years, negotiate the consent decree. But the W3 is not done. Because now that, X, now that HTML4 is ready and being worked on, it's time to put a little XML on it. This is our XML fever time. And so by January 2000, we have HTML 4.01 with XML 1.0. It's just proof that not everything Tim Berners-Lee says is the greatest, the best idea I've ever heard, right? But they call it XHTML. So, you know, we talk about Microsoft's lost years. This is the internet's lost years. Well, we went down this, maybe we can make everything be XML valid. Remember schemas? That was a great idea. By 2001, we get Windows XP. And we all have fond memories of Windows XP because we're deluded. <laughs> the later versions of XP are pretty good, but the early version didn't support USB. Uh, you know, it had a, a huge array of, of problems. They got fixed up. There's patches and so forth. This also when we have the security crisis where the internet really gets used for its real purpose, which is hacking, right? You know, in, just before XP ships, like in 2001 alone, that's when you get the Anacorna Cobra virus, the Code Red worm, Code Red 2, the Nimda worm, like it's Virus City. Enjoy the wonders of a homogeneous browser and internet community, right? That's, the hackers can hit everything. And so by 2002, Gates puts out another one of his famous letters, like the Internet Title Web. Well, this one's called Trustworthy Computing, and it will lead to XP SP2. But in the meantime, we have Internet Explorer 6, 
Now our memories of Internet Explorer 6 are bad. And there's a reason. The committees around trying to improve X, uh, 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 HTML, the W3C, were struggling with this XML thing. They weren't working on, CSS hadn't been ratified, they were sort of stuck. And Microsoft insisted on shipping IE6 with XP. And so, because they couldn't set the standards, get it settled, they just shipped the version they had. So this is a version of, of CSS before version one that was included in IE6. That's part of the problem, right? It was non-compliant with standards. The real sin of IE6 is that it persisted as long as it did. Now, one of the reasons is that Microsoft stopped making new versions of browsers for many, many years. Like, it would literally be six years. And the reason was they took that browser team and poured them on a new project, which was the next version of Windows. They actually worked on a technology called Avalon, which you'll eventually know is XAML. So while that was being invented, they weren't paying any attention to browsers at all. They were focused on that problem, which is why there's such a long delay here. The reason we are frustrated with IE6 back in the day is not that it was bad, because it was, but because it was popular and not compliant with standards. We have a new browser like that, we just call it Safari. Of course, .NET does finally come along by February of 2002. We get ASP.NET, we get C Sharp, and we get a new way to do development, right? ASP.NET becomes this driving force of a new way to do web development. Of course, the majority of Microsoft developers are WinForm developers. They've never spent any time on the web before. They don't really know their way around it. And so Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, creates tooling to allow WinForm thinking people to make web pages. It's a very practical decision that makes them very awful web pages. And while they're neglecting the browser, the shrapnel that was Netscape reforms into the Mozilla Foundation and produces a new browser we know is Firefox. First ships in September of 2002, and it will gain popularity primarily with the Digirati. Right? This became the developer's browser. It actually peaks in about 2009 at about a third of all the browsers in the world. And it makes all the mistakes that very successful browsers make. They add more and more tooling to it. It becomes a better and better tool for web developers to the point where I remember opening Firefox and going for lunch and waiting for everything to patch. And you know, we have a new browser for that now. We call it Chrome. Uh, Safari comes around the same time, 2003. Now, I'm going to sort of hit some highlights here, important things that happen in web development world. Um, Safari's not important yet. It's just on the Mac, and nobody really cares. And you can get IE for the Mac. But a really important thing comes out of a young man by the name of uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen, DHH. Now, DHH was building software as a service way before we had the term software as a service. He worked on a product called Basecamp email-driven software as a service. And he didn't like how hard it was to improve Basecamp, to iterate on Basecamp, to innovate on Basecamp. And so he put together Rails. He picked the language, Ruby, which was, had been around for years before, but nobody seemed to care all that much. But it was you know, a dynamic language. It was fun. But Rails was the important part of this whole thing. And of course, he did it open source. And this happens remarkably fast. So he puts out the first version of Rails in 2005, December of 2005. By the middle of 2007, Apple includes it with their dev stack. Apple. And they hate everybody. We also see the first version of what will eventually become the cloud. The first Amazon Web Services actually come out in March 2006 with S3 and EC2. Well, actually, the first version is 2002. They'll relaunch it with the new branding. In 2002, they were really thinking in terms of creating ways for third parties to have stores attached to Amazon. And they weren't thinking about generic development. It was just store management. But after a few years of that, they sort of appreciate this idea of, hey, we should let them do anything they want. And so 2006 is the relaunch of that idea. So you want a, so you want a web server. Well, stand up your own, run it in our environment. Also in 2006, Microsoft realized, hey, maybe this web thing's going to be a thing, and they make a new conference called Mix. What did they announce at Mix? They announced Internet Explorer 7. Now, I've quietly walked past other things that happened in this time span, because later on in 2006 is when they'll ship the 
uh, the operating system that won't be mentioned, which is why there is an IE7, because the Avalon team got done and pushed it over, over to the operating system team, and they got to work on a new version of the browser to compete with Firefox, and that was IE7. They also mentioned a thing called Windows Presentation Foundation Everywhere, which is the worst code name ever. Now, we interviewed Brad Abrams about this right at the very beginning on .NET Rocks, and we asked him about this terrible code name. He says, look, there's simple rules. If you have a cool pro code name like Avalon, you get a terrible product name like Windows Presentation Foundation. But if you have a terrible code name like Windows Presentation Foundation everywhere, you get a great product name like Serverlight. I'm going to talk about Silverlight a little later on. First, we have to talk about this stupid thing. Now, uh, it's 2007. This is not a good phone. The first version was a 2G phone. They didn't even support 3G. But it had Safari on it. You can see it right there. And Jobs came out and said, if you're going to program for the iPhone, you're going to program in Safari. He was anticipating a better web browser than he was actually able to make at that time. He was thinking about HTML5. He'd seen the future. You'll see this over and over again. We predict the future. We come up with the future, and then we made, made, want to make it come true far before it's actually coming true. And I feel like the phone died after this, right? Because be before the iPhone, phones were cool. They had slide-out keyboards and different kinds of antennas, and like you, you can have some fun. And after the iPhone, every phone looks the same. It's a slab of black glass. Actually, the positive thing I would say about what the iPhone really did is that it turned us all into cyborgs. We all have digital extensions to ourselves. What we, we're now seeing smartphone sales decline because we're running out of humans that don't have them. Right? It's like 4 billion smartphones in the world. That's about how many adults there are in the world. Again, not evenly distributed, but that's how smartphones are everywhere. And most of the time when you think about cyborgs, you know, you go all science fiction, right? Well, you should be on the inside of you. I'm like, well, A, you, and B, messes with upgrades. I don't want to have to have surgery every six months because I want a new phone. But it is important because it fundamentally changes the web. We're on a path now to mobile being the only thing that matters in the web. Uh, Microsoft starts fixing some of the mistakes they've made with an alternative to web forms, finally. There's an apocryphal story about MVC, too. I don't know if you've ever heard this, that he wrote it on the way to a conference. It's not true. So the MVC project had been gestating for a while. They were always looking for an alternative development model for web pages inside of the .NET space. And the prototypes they actually used to do some recruiting. I've got it you know, from Phil Hack himself, that he was recruited into Microsoft the first time. Uh, because of seeing a prototype of MVC. What is true is that Guthrie decided to show MVC and write the demo on the way to a conference. Because okay, the conference he was going to is a conference called Alt.net. Did you ever hear this? We talked about it a lot on the show. So Alt.net was this movement to say that open source was an evil in the Microsoft world. Because a lot of Microsoft devs at the time we're only interested in stuff that came from Microsoft or their immediate partners, you know, the, the Dev Expresses and the Telerics and so forth of the world. And the idea that they would go and look at SourceForge for code that could possibly work in .NET, it was anathema. They wouldn't do that. And so the Alt.NET .NET movement, in the friendliest version I can paint of it, because they were not always that friendly, said, hey, some of this open source stuff is good. You should use it. And they were very critical of web forms because it was highly resistant to testing or maintaining in any way. And MVC represented a pattern that could actually be somewhat more manageable code. And so that's the demo. They invited Guthrie to keynote the first Alt.net conference in Austin. He said yes, and then showed up with a demo of MVC and blew them all out of the water, because he's that cool. That is serious geek cool. Uh, and Microsoft will ship the first version of MVC as an open source project under the Microsoft public license, because they still found a way to make mistakes with open source. In that same time frame, we get the first version of Chrome. That's in 2008. So Eric Schmidt did not want to ship a browser. He was CEO of Google at that time. But he made the mistake of, or the company made the mistake of hiring a bunch of Firefox guys that were frustrated with the Mozilla Foundation, who kept making browsers in their spare time. This is back when Google had 20% time. 
And eventually one of the demos of the 20% time was such a good browser, he's like, okay, make a product. <laughs> and that's pretty much where Chrome came from. Now, you remember the Rails guy, DHH, David Hansen? So David Hansen writes a blog post in July of 2008 where he says, look, I am not building any more versions of Basecamp that run against IE6. I am sick to death of this. This browser is a decade old, and it is wrong. He's sort of the first to say, we need to actively kill IE6. Now, he's not alone. That's in July. Uh, he, so he actually put the blog post out in July of 2008. He said, I'm going to phase out support for Basecamp on IE6 by August, like next month. Then when enough of his customers go, no, you're not, he goes, December. <laughs> <laughs> but it starts the momentum. By February of 2009, a group of Norwegian media sites actually go the step of, if you load, try and load their web page on IE6, it literally pops up a window that says, you're using IE6, you need to stop. Here are links to real browsers. Go get one. At that point, even Microsoft people jump on board. Hanselman, Scott Hanselman actually has a blog post from that same period. It says, you really need to stop using IE6. Now, the good news is we have IE7, but yeah, you need to get rid of IE6. Why did IE6 persist? It's because of XP and Vista, right? People did not install Vista because they got scared by it. They stayed with XP, and the default browser was IE6. The average mortal never does anything other than the defaults, and so... IE6 persisted, and it kept persisting. And really, the only reason we got rid of IE6, I believe, is Win7. And we finally, they built a version of the, of the operating system we didn't hate that had a newer version of the browser. We switched. Uh, and, I, and when I say we, I mean none of us in this room, because we were all running other browsers, right? Talking about regular mortals. All right. So. There goes IE6, and now we can talk about Silverlight. So the first version of Silverlight in September of 2007 is actually a, really a media player. The programming language is JavaScript. They don't actually get in with .NET until uh, October of 2008. And I don't know why we didn't talk about this more at the time, but they built a version of the CLR that ran on the Mac that worked through Safari. And that was astonishing. That it just wasn't a big deal. Oh, by the way, you can write this code in XAML and C Sharp, and it runs on the Mac. Ta-da. The fond version of Silverlight, the one everybody loves, actually was three. And that is from July of 2007, uh, 2009. And then it goes on from there. And one of the reasons it's so successful at that time is that JavaScript is still a mocked language. Right? It's not pretty. It's still the glue that Brendan Eich had sort of intended to be. We were still limping along with it in a, in a lot of respects. And there were other plug-in models. Flash is very popular. It leaks memory like a sieve. But ActiveScript, like, these are ways to build fairly sophisticated things that run the browser. Silverlight was very much a copy of Flash, except the language was better, the syntax was better, and the implementation was better. And so if you could work with browsers that supported it, Life was pretty good, and for a long time, it was all browsers. But JavaScript's not done, because an, an interesting man by the name of Douglas Crockford puts out a wonderful book, JavaScript, The Good Parts, where he actually writes what is essentially a treatise that says not everything in JavaScript is horrible. Yes, there are horrible bits, but if you stay away from those and stay with these other parts, it could be better. That's December of 2008, and I feel it's a seminal moment. The people who read this book would take it to heart, and some of them will, and start really trying to take JavaScript more seriously. And in the next few years, JavaScript would be transformed. In that same time span, Microsoft finally gets on the cloud with Windows Azure. This is February of 2010. It has SQL Azure in it, support for PHP, Java, and .NET. What's interesting is we really didn't like it. If you were going to program in .NET on Azure at this time, you had the web role and the app role. And that was about it. You had to custom write your code to run 
in Azure didn't run anywhere else. What I find funny in 2018 is like, dude, they were offering a serverless in 2010. We just didn't want it. Sort of my reminder that smart people tend to bring answers but never show their work. And what really happened to Azure that ultimately made it successful is they stopped just showing, you know, you're going to want this. Okay, now well, let's go back. First, you're going to want virtual machines, and then you're going to want some platform services. And then, uh, can we have serverless? What a good idea. Just had to go through the path. So often smart people, you know, Jobs wasn't wrong about HTML5. He was just too early. And Azure wasn't wrong with web roll, app roll. They were just too early. But we have more disruptive forces in action. By 2010, this giant iPhone arrives. Now, it wasn't the giant iPhone arrived. That wasn't the big deal, although tablets were a pretty big deal. And we forget what was going on in computing at that time in 2010. 2010 was also the era where they were trying to make the $500 laptop. They're trying to drive down the price of laptops. And in order to get down to $500 for a laptop, and they never really got there, it was like 700 or so, they were terrible laptops. They were all plastic and cheaply made, and like it was crap. And then out came this $800 tablet that was beautiful. And that laptop was doomed. So in some ways, the iPad saved the laptop. Because suddenly, the only way you could make a laptop make sense is if you spent, made it worth about 1,200 bucks. So you made a nice laptop. That's the beginning of the Ultrabooks, which really came from the iPad. But it's not the important part of the iPad. The important part of the iPad is that Flash killed it. Very quickly, they figured out that Flash murdered the battery on the iPad. And by April, Jobs puts out a letter in the, Washington Street, uh, in the, the Wall Street Journal called Thoughts on Flash. And what he says is that plugins are bad. They're hard on the machine, they're vectors for malware, and Safari is going to block all plugins going forward. We're going to keep our computers safe and not murdering their batteries. There will be workarounds. There's a third party browser you could install that would run Flash. You could watch your battery level go down on your iPad. But that was sort of the death. Actually, at that point in April of 2010, Silverlight is effectively dead. We just didn't know. Right? What he really has said at that moment is Silverlight will never run on iOS, period. Which also wasn't true, but that's what it looked like. The good news is Microsoft shipped WinPhone 7. Uh, also in 2010, we get Studio 2010, which was a very fundamental version of Studio. They've now sort of cleaned up everything that happened in, Silver, in, uh, with, in Vista around version 3, 3.5. Now they're getting to 4, which is actually the third version of CLR because numbers are hard. Uh, they get the first version of F Sharp. They get Silverlight 4, which actually was the fourth version. It's the one that now supports Chrome and runs out of browser. I would argue from a web perspective, the most important thing that happened in 2010 is that it shipped with jQuery. Right? This is Microsoft taking open source seriously. We're going to include jQuery in the box. Now, part of what happens doing that is in order to deal with all the legalities around shipping jQuery in the box is they support jQuery becoming a foundation which today is now known as the JavaScript Foundation. But the, all of that begins in 2010. This is also when they implement WPF inside of Studio, which is a great way to make Studio run really, really slow. Uh, jQuery had been around for a while. But John Resig did the original versions back in 2006. It was the beginning of, I, in a lot of ways, the really serious tooling around JavaScript. And Resig certainly uh, a uh, a fan of Doug Crockford and this idea that JavaScript didn't have to suck. Believe it or not, back in that time span is when Angular starts. Now, Angular is an internal project inside of Google, right? They, they'd been working on it for a couple of years at that point, and uh, I've talked to guys like Brad Green and, and, and uh, Igor Minar who were advocating for Angular being used more inside of Google until they're finally cornered by a VP and said, if your tech's so good, why isn't anybody else in the world using it? Well, it's only internal. Well, if it's only good enough to be internal, why is it good enough for my team? And they were basically bullied into releasing it publicly in 2010. The ver the, and this really is uh, an impact on what will become single page application. We also start getting specifications around responsive web design. Now, we did not need CSS3 
and media queries to make responsive web design. Uh, Audi.com, go and go load up the Wayback Machine and look at Audi.com's website from like 2002. It's responsive. If you narrow the window down, it will redraw itself to fit properly into that window. Those guys quietly, while selling in a ridiculously expensive German car, wrote some really elegant HTML going back to those early days. Now, without a doubt, media queries make responsive design much easier, but it, had been, it, it took a while for it to actually matter. This is 2009 that we first get these. We won't really talk about responsive design until the 20 teens. Right, 2013, 2014 is where, where the movement towards responsive design becomes a big deal. Tablets are popular. We now, you know, it was fine when we, we had two form factors. We had your computer, you had your phone. And so you had your regular web page and M dot. Then the tablet came along and ruined everything. Now three sizes, so do we have T dot? Should we do that? No, no. So responsive web design. 2009 is also, well, it's actually 2011 when we really get serious, but it starts earlier than that. The battle of the browsers. This was a really interesting time from a browser technology point of view. This is when the browser makers kind of took control of the W3C, because what they did was compete with innovation. They would build features against each other. They would challenge each other to be better. They would send each other cakes. When IE9 shipped, the Chrome team sent the, the IE9 team a big congratulations cake. But amazing things happened in this period. The first is we started actually thinking about JavaScript independent of the browser. So they talked about the V8 engine and the Chakra engine and the Nitro engine. And really feeding off of what Doug Crockford was talking about in that book, JavaScript, The Good Parts. Can we make JavaScript amazing? Can we make it powerful? And this competition between these different teams, they, over a period of a couple of years, iterated incredibly rapidly. They started pre-compiling JavaScript to increase its execution speeds. They started pipelining. They started using GPUs to do rendering. And they started implementing a bunch of theoretical features that would be eventually become HTML5, sometimes poorly, and sometimes well. And for the web developer, we got to experiment a lot, quickly. There were new things all the time. We made mistakes. Uh, Chrome shipped a bunch of features uh, in experimental versions of Chrome that people implemented as product when they shouldn't have. And when they pulled them back out, it broke the product, made a lot of people angry. And so we learned you've got to be careful how you deploy things you're not sure you're going to keep. But one of the key things that came out of this was this idea that JavaScript could be more than glue for browsers. And the evidence really came in that same time space with Node. So Node, it started in 2009, largely against the V8 engine. But by 2011, there was a shocker implementation. It's just this conversation now of what if we could build, use JavaScript outside of the browser? But more importantly, we were reversing the behaviors of IIS and Apache. Now, there is no knife. You have to pick up each blade one at a time. What do you want to do? You're literally declaratively building your web service piece by piece. So as much as it was the language, it was also the philosophy. Only the things I need, nothing else. We also got Bootstrap, so that everybody could stop thinking about CSS. And uh, Anders Halsberg ships the first version of TypeScript. And I've had some great conversations with him about the motivations around this. But bringing static typing to TypeScript, I mean, and I would argue the what was remarkable about this is this is still when Microsoft's are wrestling over the idea of open source, but they do open source TypeScript, and the open source community embraces it. We're not that far away from Microsoft being the evil empire when TypeScript came along, and generally loathed by the open source community. And yet when TypeScript arrived, everybody in the open source community started building extensions for their libraries to work against TypeScript properly, very, very rapidly. It was astonishing. And I, and I think it was a talking point inside of Microsoft that it's like, if you make good things and you make them open source, the community will not automatically reject them. And then the Angular team picked it up and said, you know, this is probably a good way to build sustainable projects long term. It's a great endorsement. But Microsoft itself doesn't change really until 2014. When Satya Nadella becomes CEO of Microsoft, but I would argue even more importantly, when they stopped naming stuff Windows and started naming it Microsoft. 
it speaks to a philosophical change inside of Microsoft that happens in 2014. We finally get ratified specifications for HTML and CSS and what is now EC5 in 2014, and CSS is still awesome. And then Microsoft starts building up open source projects from scratch. They take Electron and they make, they make an editor with it. And they release it as VS Code. And in, it's the second time after TypeScript that the open source community goes, that's just a good idea, and runs with it. And so you start to see this cultural shift happen that Microsoft can actually play in the open source community in a meaningful way. And then they made Edge, showing that not everything to do is perfect. That's July of 2015 with Win 10, which still, you know, folks different levels of adoption, and Edge has its own set of issues. Of course, they start off, actually, the, the, the code name for Edge was Spartan. And it, was, it probably should have been the product name because it was a very Spartan version of a browser where less nothing ran. It, it was too tight. And I'm coming into the end of my time here, but let's talk about a couple of other, the latest checks, uh, stuff that's being talked about at this show too, like progressive web apps. So it was the Chrome team, uh, Behrman and Russell, that really coined the term, but they were trying to think about the browser as the host for apps, period. What would you need? They were certainly thinking in the mobile context, so dealing with inconsistent connectivity, dealing with backend services, dealing with messaging, and so forth. I mean, the primary thing we've actually done with PWAs is kind of find a way to keep 20 or 30 versions of Chrome running on your machine at all times, just in case we need to pop up toast. But it's actually more than that. We've just got to start actually doing it. Microsoft puts out Core with the MIT license in June of 2016 and has rapidly iterated on it by August of last year, so just a little over a year ago, we got up to version two, which was actually the third version of core because numbers are hard. The fourth version called three should be out sometime next year. And I'm gonna pretty much end on this guy. Anybody recognize him? This is Steve Sanderson. He works for Microsoft but he works his own kind of way. Every time I get a chance to interview this guy, he's astonishing. This is the knockout JS guy. And this is the JavaScript services guy. And at NDC in 2017, he'd found a weird old version of C Sharp written in C++ as an open source project. And he took advantage of a set of extensions that existed inside of Chrome called WebAssembly. And he made a version of C Sharp that kind of, sort of, maybe, ran inside of the browser. And I was there, Dave Fowler was there, one of the smartest web guys inside of Microsoft, and Dave Fowler, Steve, uh, Seth Juarez is the best impression of David Fowler looking at Steve Sanderson showing the impossible. Dave sort of looks like this. Like he's trying to keep his brain from bursting out of his head. And this is now known as Blazor, or Razor Pages for the browser, Blazor. Now, since June of 2017, when Sanderson first showed this off as very much his own code, other crazy people have rallied to his cause. The most important one being Miguel Diacaza. Because the pipeline for WebAssembly is through C. So essentially what they're doing is they're, the same way that we lifted JavaScript out of the browser and said, hey, you can run this anywhere. What we now said is the container that JavaScript sits in inside of the browser, what if we could just put whatever language you wanted in there or anything we wanted in there? and the pipeline into it is C. And so the reason Miguel got involved is Miguel's got a pretty good version of C Sharp written in C. Because Roslyn, the dot, .NET Core version of C Sharp, is written in C Sharp. So you can't use that. But Miguel got involved and this whole thing accelerated. Now Microsoft's been very careful about what to do about Blazor. They've, done, they've moved it over to the ASP.NET project set. They're calling it experimental while iterating like wildfire. But at the same time, I think other people are starting to take WebAssembly seriously, and I point at the Google guys with Golang, and they're making a Golang implementation inside of WebAssembly. Which brings us up to this idea of what's next for web development. We now have, between progressive web apps and WebAssembly, our ability to do anything we need to in any operating environment through the browser, living in the browser security context, which makes IT people happy. We can pick the language we want to work in. We 
JavaScript is now the most portable language, runs anywhere we want it to. Microsoft has bought GitHub, and the world didn't end. And while it's important that they have GitHub, and I don't disagree that they should have GitHub, I'm far more interested in Electron. Because Electron is desktop through JavaScript. And I can't think of a better organization in terms of making desktop better than those guys over at Microsoft. So I can't wait to see what they do with Electron. But I feel like as web developers, we've never had more choice. You love JavaScript? Write anywhere you want. You like building web pages, web services? Write them in any language you want. We're just at the beginning of this. You know, I've taken you through just a little over 20 years of tour, and I feel like we're at the beginning. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thanks very much.